I'm so glad that you could join us today for this talk uh, on Kobo Publishing. Well, we'll be joined by Mark Lefebvre. Uh, hello, Mark. How are you doing? Hey, Martin. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad. Where are we uh, finding you today? You're finding me in Waterloo, Ontario at my home office. I'm going to dip off. Uh, I'll be pulling the strings uh, for the slide deck you've kindly prepared. Awesome. Thank you so much, Martin. And uh, welcome, everyone, from uh, around the world. Um, I want to jump right into the slides so you can get to look at the slides instead of looking at my bald head with the sunlight bouncing off of it. Um, just as I begin, I just want to remind people I don't actually work for Kobo any longer, although I did work for Kobo for six years as the director of self-publishing and author relations there. Um, but I do have a lot of insights that I wanted to share with you. So I want to get through these insights, uh, talk about some of the basics. Uh, there are a reminder, there's a free reads the email course where you can get some of these details as well in case you need to read it as well as hear it. And if uh, you can go to the next slide, Martin, that'd be great. Um, as I wait for the slide to come up, we're just going to kind of understand what is Kobo, why is Kobo important, and, and how uh, is Kobo uh, working, uh, specifically how it's different from Amazon. Um, the, the question often comes up of publishing to Kobo direct versus distributor, and there's pros and cons for each, and I'm going to be completely uh, transparent and walk through whatever works for you. I'm going to specifically talk about the humans at Kobo, and that's one of the ways they're really different, and how the merchandising works there, and very specifically thinking about the ways that you can catch a merchandiser's eye, which include professionalism, uh, behaving more like a traditional publisher, and I'll get to reasons why that's important with a retailer like Kobo, talking about clean pricing metadata and promotion tools. And so jumping right into an understanding of Kobo, we're going to take a look at uh, understanding, even if you're doing really, really well in a place like Amazon, looking at the places where Kobo uh, retails in. Now, Kobo sells in 190 countries. This is a map of my Kobo Writing Life dashboard map of my sales since um, almost day one of the of the of the platform and the blue dots represent um, where in the world books have sold and as you can see the larger the blue dot the higher the percentage so countries like Canada in Australia are very, very typical for most um, authors. Most authors that uh, I, I worked with would sell most of their books in Canada, Australia. Me specifically, 44% um, of my sales at Kobo come from Canada, then 20% US, then 13 UK, then Australia, then New Zealand. Then you get into a whole bunch of other countries. And, and so thinking about, uh, if you can move to the next slide, Martin, Thinking about the um, that global presence isn't just Kobo.com or Kobo um, uh, in, in some of the various uh, sites, but it's actually the retail partnerships that Kobo has. And that kind of lends to a little bit of the differences between a place like Kobo and uh, a place like uh, Amazon. And and I don't see the next slide up. I'm not sure if other people can see it up yet, but um, this is just a quick, quick peek at when you're looking at Kobo, your book's not available just at Kobo. It's available at the bookseller retail partner in the various countries. So here in Canada, where I'm from, Chapters Indigo, when you're buying an ebook from them, you're actually buying it from Kobo. You've probably heard the news recently in the last few months that Kobo just partnered with Walmart in the US. So when you're buying ebooks from Walmart, and you can even see the branding there with that Walmart star, it's powered by Rakuten Kobo. And in Japan, for example, Rakuten, which is the, the company that owns Kobo, is a major player. They're Amazon-sized uh, in Japan. They have Angus and Robertson in, the, in uh, Australia. They have independent bookstores in New Zealand. They also have the American Booksellers Association in the U.S. There's about 600 independent bookstores across Canada that you can find through IndieBound.org that actually are selling Kobo eBooks. Now, one of the other larger uh, partners that's very significant is Bull.com in the Netherlands. And this is where Kobo has the Kobo Plus um, opportunity for authors, which means you, you can have your book listed not just on Kobo.com and on Bull.com, but if you add your book to Kobo Plus, which is kind of like, think of it like Kindle Unlimited without the ex exclusivity clauses, meaning it's a subscription-based program with royalty sharing for everyone whose books are read in that time period. On Kobo, it's a 20% read. And what happens is if you're in Kobo Plus in uh, in the Netherlands and in Belgium, which are the only two territories where that exists, your book's listed is uh, a regular retail book on Bull.com and on Kobo.com, but it's also listed in the Kobo Plus catalog on Bull and on Kobo. So in that, uh, you know, the Netherlands and Belgium, in those countries, you get four listings for the price of one. And, and that's part of understanding that uh, more global base. 
Um, in countries like uh, France, uh, FNAC, which I, I described to Americans who aren't familiar with that, is it's almost like um, Best Buy and uh, Barnes and Noble had a baby because FNAC has all of the you know the books, the music, the entertainment, the electronics, um, and Kobo of course powers the, their eBooks, and they're very powerful in France and countries like Spain as well. Um, but that just gives you a sense of an idea. So when you're thinking about Kobo globally, it's not always just Kobo.com. It's that powerful partner they have. So moving on to the next slide, this kind of is one of the big differentiators for Kobo compared to Amazon. It's Kobo is only about books and reading. They move into a territory and they partner with a strong retailer uh, who is good at print books, for example. And, and maybe other products, and they focus on books, so ebooks and audiobooks. And one of the benefits of audiobooks for uh, Kobo, and I know you can get your audiobooks into Kobo through Findaway Voices, for example, um, and they're go soon going to be launching a way to do it directly, is the app, the free app on iOS and Android, et cetera, is the same app. So on Kindle, you have a Kindle app and an Audible app. On Kobo, it's a single app where your ebooks and audiobooks are there handy. Uh, easy for you to access. The main difference, and this is because Kobo was born out of Chapters Indigo here in Canada. It was initially a spun-off company, and then it got purchased by Rakuten a few years later. But it was born out of traditional book selling, and that's a significant difference with the way uh, that the inmates run the asylum uh, at Amazon, for example, where it's you know 90% of it's uh, algorithm-based. Whereas at Kobo, there's a lot of algorithms going on in the background, but there's a lot of human merchandising, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. We also have the Rakuten and the retail partnerships, which is also critical because that partnership and collaboration is built into the DNA of Kobo. And if you understand that Kobo's about partnering rather than taking over and dominating, you have a better understanding of what may work when you're trying to work with Kobo. Now, the royalty structure is uh, most people think of $2.99 to $9.99 as the optimum one. Well, on, on Kobo, there's no cap. So if your book is priced $2.99 US dollars or up, um, there's no cap. There's no cap on the 70%, which uh, is really important for selling higher priced items. And we'll talk about why that's important for Kobo. Um, and if you price under $2.99, you're actually making 45%, not 35%. It's a small difference, but hey, every 10% in your pocket is a good 10% in your pocket. Um, there's also no delivery costs based on EPUB file, file size, which you'll also see on Amazon. So when you're making 70% on Amazon, you're really not making 70%. You're making 70% minus that whisper sync um, fee that they have um, that's built in. So you're really probably making 69.1% percent or something like that. But but that's a small thing. Um, and then the difference in scale. So here's here's an important factor to remember is when you're when you're publishing to Kobo, you're not going to see results right away. Uh, on average, I, I remember seeing it would take six to nine months for an author to actually gain a foothold. Now, one of the reasons is so Amazon's huge in the US. There's 326 million people in the US. Kobo is huge in Canada, but the population of Canada is about the equivalent of uh, the state of California in terms of uh, population size. So that's something that when you think about that, um, it was at 17 million uh, folks in Canada, that's a relatively small number. So uh, even when you're doing well on Kobo, think about that scale. And that's usually often for every 10 books you'd sell on Amazon, you'd be selling one on Kobo. So if you're trying to compare apples to oranges, that's a, that's a decent number for you to take a look at. Now, if we move on to the next slide, um, we're going to take a, a quick look at um, the two main reasons you're going to publish to Kobo, or the two main options you're going to use. You can go direct via Kobo Writing Life, which is at kobo.com slash writing life, or you can use a third-party distributor. And there's multiple options. Yes, I work for draft to digital because I love and respect draft to digital um, but Smashwords has been around from the beginning of time. Uh, there's a way to get into Kobo. There are other companies globally as well, like StreetLib and Publish Drive that authors might use. The one uh, way I would caution you not to publish your eBooks to Kobo is I wouldn't publish your eBooks to Kobo through as much as I love Ingram Spark. They're fantastic for POD and print on demand distribution. Not as good at eBooks. I would go with one of these other uh, distributors. I'm obviously biased towards draft to digital, but again, it's your choice on how to do that. Now, the pros of publishing direct to Kobo through Kobo Writing Life are pretty obvious, I think. The, you get direct control, you get the full 70% discount, and most importantly, I think, is you get that built-in promotional tool that we'll talk about. Now, the pros of using a distributor 
are you save time. Sure, you give up 10% uh, where you're making 60% instead of 70%. But instead of publishing to five different platforms, you publish to one and you only make the change once. So if you're getting a BookBub deal or you're doing some sort of promo through a written word media company, for example, like Bargain Booksy or an e-reader news today, you don't have to log in five times and change your price five times. And for some authors, especially those who don't have an executive assistant, which is most of us, or a virtual assistant, um, that takes time, and that takes time away from your writing. Uh, similarly, the single point of handling that payment, sales, looking at your reporting, uh, the ease of looking at your reporting on a single platform as opposed to having to purchase the tools to, to use a third party, yet again, another place to log in. So again, some of the pros of distribution involve saving yourself some time. So moving on to the next uh, step, and this is some of the details that you need to really pay attention to, and it goes back to that global, is, is pricing. And it really, really matters what you're doing. Localized and natural looking prices are critical. This is a screenshot that you're seeing here of the um, uh, within Cobra Writing Life of the tool that allows you to price um, um, globally. Now, because I'm in Canada, my, mine is going to show me a CID as a default. If you're in the US, chances are it'll be US, or if you're in the UK, it's going to be GBP or something like that. But it's really important not just to enter a US price, for example. Uh, or a GBP price or a CAD price and leave it. It's really, really important to go in and take control of your global pricing. And one of the things that's recommended is you can round uh, in, in US dollars, in Canadian dollars, in Australian dollars, and in New Zealand dollars, ideally round to the nearest 99 cents. And the reason behind that logic is relatively simple. When a customer sees a book, let's say you put in a book priced at $4.99 US dollars. Uh, let's say um, the conversion based on the exchange rate, today's exchange rate is 1.3 something into Canadian dollars. So, and I'm not good at math, but imagine that maybe comes to $6.27. When a customer sees a price of $6.27, they've automatically rounded it up to $7 in their head. It's a psychology thing that we always do. Um, so you have two choices. You can round up to 99 where you can round down to $5.99 because in the customer's mind, they're already paying that next dollar. Uh, and if it's already within that dollar range, even based on the economies of scale in Canada and Australia, for example, where books are ridiculously overpriced, going up to that next 99 usually just means an extra 50 or 60 cents in your pocket. What I'm not suggesting is I'm not suggesting that you rip off customers in Canada and Australia, what I'm suggesting is that you're aware that book pricing in different countries follow different parameters and following those book pricing globally is going to probably help you on Kobo a lot more than it ever would on Amazon. So that's kind of an important thing to remember. Now in, uh, in pounds and in euros, um, when you're looking at uh, the pricing, you, you're, you can go back to 99 cents or 0.49 cents. And the reason for that is the euro and the pounds usually significantly um, stronger than the American dollar. And it's a lot more natural for consumers in Europe and in the UK to see prices uh, consistently that have the 49 or the 99 uh, price point. And that just makes it a little bit easier to round to the nearest one to, to make sure you're bringing value to the customer. But one last uh, specific thing on, on pricing that I want to remind authors is when you sign a contract with Kobo or with any of the retailers directly like Kindle, you're agreeing that your price will not be lower on any other retail price. It's actually in the fine print of every single contract you sign with a retailer. So when I'm talking about changing your pricing, I'm assuming you're going to change them on all platforms consistently. So if your book is $4.99 Canadian and uh, for $6.99 Canadian and $4.99 US dollars, it is that on Kobo and on Kindle. Well, Nook only has US, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and But also on iBooks, uh, which is global and even on uh, Google, if you happen to have a Google account. Um, and that's where using a single distributor makes life a little bit easier. Now, I want to talk a little bit about pricing. So Pricing at Kobo is different because Kobo was born out of traditional merchandising and retailing. And a lot of their uh, price practices are based on working with the big publishers. And even if you're looking at a, a price point that's a little bit higher, what I remember seeing was that the average list price across all of fiction would be about $7.50. 
most of the the titles uh, south of that were from indie authors, and most of the titles north of that were from the larger traditional publishers. So there was there was usually a bit of a variance where indie authors could stand to walk the price point up just a little bit more, uh, not to rip off customers, but in order to be more in line with the average price points. And so this is one of the ways I like to describe how the humans at Kobo uh, make a difference. Pretend for a second, and it's not that all that hard to pretend because it's true. The only way that Kobo makes money is when uh, you sell books. That's how, well, they, they do sell e-readers and stuff like that, but their main source of income is selling e-books and they keep that share of the e-book. So imagine a merchandiser is looking at two titles at the same time. And it's a beautiful thriller, and it's everything that everyone wanted it to be. It's the next Gone Girl. It is the next. Um, it's the next um, um, Suzanne Collins. It's the next J.K. Rowling title. It's a beautiful book. It's exactly what they want to merchandise. Uh, but there's two books that look exactly the same, perfect for the uh, ideal audience, and they want to feature it on the main page, or they want to feature it in an email blast. Uh, the one book, uh, let's say, is 99 cents, and the other book is 9.99. This is what's going through the merchandiser's mind. Okay, on the 99 cent one, the author slash publisher gets 45 uh, cents. Kobo keeps 54 cents. The book that's 9.99, the author gets seven dollars, and the uh, Kobo keeps three dollars. So pretending that everyone at Kobo wants to keep their jobs because they know that that's how they make money, uh, and assuming that. And this is relatively true. Um, they're going to sell about the same number of units if they feature that title. Which one do you think they're more likely to want to feature to meet all of their sales targets? And that's why coming in with bargain basement prices and only focusing on bargain basement prices makes it really, really hard for a Kobo merchandiser to select your beautiful, perfect title, wonderfully edited, perfect cover, great synopsis, all the things that you got uh, to make that perfect. Uh, that's why they're going to feature a higher price title in place of yours. So when you're looking at trying to get promotional space in Kobo, pricing really does matter. Now, um, as particularly for some of the promos I'm going to talk about, like the monthly 30% off promos that work really, really well on Kobo, 30% off of a book that's priced $2.99 is nowhere near as good a deal as 30% off a book that's priced $6.99. From the customer's point of view, that 30% is a much bigger chunk of change. So next slide, please. <clears throat> As I clear my throat and, and, and pause. Now, this title I'm showing you from Lauren Royal is $27 Canadian. It's the Chase Family Series. It is a nine-book historical romance box set of the entire series of books that she had um, uh, at the time. She included it in one of those 30% off promo features from Kobo. And because obviously the cover was beautiful and the price point was nice, one of the merchandisers, they'd look at it and they have 200 titles to consider. Somebody from marketing, somebody from merchandising says, hey, I like this cover. I'm going to stick this as the number one book in our, in our email blast that goes out to the targeted customers. And Lauren woke up the next day to find that this book was... Um, number one on Kobo, and it was number one for a few days in a row. And, and considering that there's no price cap on Kobo and on Apple uh, Books, by the way, um, she was making 70% of $27 Canadian. Um, so you don't need to sell uh, you know, 100,000 copies at 99 cents to make real money on this. She was making really, really good money on this right, uh, right away. Uh, and it was part of a promo. Uh, and again, it was a little bit of luck of the draw, but it was also evidence that uh, an indie author can can actually charge a significant amount of money. Now, keep in mind, this is, um, you know, uh, 60 to 70 hours worth of reading, 2,700 uh, digital pages to read. This is almost a million words. Uh, so it's a really good value for the customer, but it's also something she didn't have to sell for $9.99 like she would at Amazon. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is one of the other things that comes into play. So I'm using a, a, an example from Joanna Penn with her Business for Authors title, because again, it's a great title. You should take a look at it on whatever platform you read on. Now, this is listed uh, from the Kobo Canadian site at $7.99 Canadian. I think Joe actually did uh, something very nice. I think she might have made it at par for US, so she was very, being very nice to us Commonwealth Canadian people. But um, what you'll see is a very clean title and a subtitle. 
very clean metadata, very clean series title. And if you look down below, I, my, my picture might be cutting it off, but uh, in, in this series, what you're seeing is because she entered in the series field within COBA Writing Life or in a place like draft to digital that allows you to enter the series information, it's coming up very, very clean. And COBO is automatically merchandising that for her. Um, she's got some great reviews there. You've got some, um, the, the series metadata is consistent. Therefore, she's, she's actually leveraging the built-in algorithms that Kobo does have, but she's also making it easier for a merchandiser who may see this book come up on a sales report. Let's say she, she booked a book bub for it or something like that. And then all of a sudden it catches their eye and they're looking at it. Now they can see, oh my goodness, she has a whole series of very similarly branded books maybe there's a promo that we can include some of the other ones in because if customers like this one book they might like the other one um, and that's how that uh, i can uh, that's how that can link back they'll also recognize that it's localized prices so if you go into kobo and you click on that little us uh, flag or canadian flag or um, the uk flag at the very top of the screen on kobo.com uh, it'll default to whatever country you're in. You can actually see what the pricing looks like in other countries. Uh, and so uh, jo Joanne is one of the authors who does that. She pays attention to what the market will bear in different countries. She very consistently prices her books in those five main English language territory uh, currencies. Um, and, and, and local merchandisers, because Kobo has merchandisers, not just in the Toronto office, but they actually have merchandisers focused on countries around the world who you know pay attention to what's going on in the UK and what are UK people interested in and how does that sync up with uh, WH Smith, the partner in the UK, and how does this title from France sync up with what FNAC wants to do, and are the prices localized to euros in a nice, clean-looking price? Those are the subtle things that um, immediately show whether or not this is an amateur or a professional to the, the mind of the merchandiser. And then of course the sales copy and taking advantage of the HTML formatting that's built in uh, when you're submitting the title is really, really important. That's one of the other things for metadata. If you move to the next slide, please. So assuming you've entered everything and you've put in all the, uh, the nice metadata, one of the big differentiating factors to get the attention of a merchandiser is pre-orders. Uh, and they work really, really well in a couple ways. Now, because Kobo was born out of traditional retailing, um, you uh, can take advantage of the fact that not a lot of indie authors are going to be planning ahead we live in a brilliant world where once your book is ready, once you get it back from your editor, once you get everything uh, done, it's we're good to go. You push the publish button and it's live and it's live within hours uh, often. That's a really exciting time for us. Uh, but because Kobo was born out of traditional retailing, they're used to working with sales reps from publishing companies who usually have a six month lead time. Um, and they often will plan their promos six to 12 weeks out. So if you were to approach someone at Kobo and say, hey, I've got this great title, it's uh, launching next week, what can you do for me? Um, they they planned for next week, eight weeks ago, or nine weeks ago, more most likely. So to stand out to someone like Kobo, you probably would want to consider, if it's ready now, what kind of lead time should you give yourself in order to see if you can leverage some of those um, some of those promotions that are coming up in the future. Even oftentimes talking to Dan uh, Wood at Drafted Digital, oftentimes looking at some of the stuff that we'd be getting from authors saying, hey, I got a, a book and it's uh, publishing in a couple of weeks, what can you do? Uh, on Kobo or Nook or even some of the other places, can't really do much because we need to give the retailers time to consider it and to plan these things out for promotions. So um, if you engage in a practice that's more in line with what some of the larger publishers are doing where they plan things out and they let them know about it well in advance, there may be an opportunity for the merchandisers and the people who work at Kobo to find a place for it because it gives them some time to go through that. Um, and it is difficult to get pre-order attention without a previous track record. So oftentimes it's a, hey, the next book in my series is out, uh, or this next standalone book is out, and here are the other books that I've published. Because one of the things that the person who works at Kobo Writing Line for the person who works at uh, as a merchandiser is going to do is they may look at your backlist and say, wow, this did uh, this kind of uh, work. Um, what if we feature it? 
could we sell more of the backlist and the new title? That's one of the other things. The other thing to, to keep in mind is leveraging pre-orders at Kobo is really, really cool because it actually doubles your ranking. So when you sell a book that's live on Kobo and the pre-order date or the order date was in the past, today or prior to today, you get a ranking boost. When it sells as a pre-order, you get two times the ranking boost. It's almost like because someone wants it before it's ready, that kind of tells the system, hey, this must be that cool that that many people want it in advance. So um, leveraging that can be really, really important, particularly with your mailing list, for example, because that could get a merchandiser's attention because the merchandisers in the different countries are paying attention to daily reports and they're looking for titles that are already moving. On one side, it's almost a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, but on the other side, it's a pretty awesome thing because if you can get even a little bit of early pre-order traction, your ranking goes up, other people see it, it starts to feed the algorithms just like the way that uh, people play on Amazon. But a merchandiser may find it and say, wow, what's this new title in this category? I'm going to put this aside and feature it in that thing I'm planning for in two weeks because I see that it's releasing. It, you know, It's not releasing for another a few weeks. So that's a great way to leverage pre-orders. On the next slide, we will see um, if you're publishing pre-orders directly to Kobo Writing Life, I would strongly recommend, provided you've got six to 12 minimum lead time in advance, um, take a look at the built-in promotions within Kobo Writing Life. Uh, and I'll talk about how to get that in a minute. Um, but uh, you can always email the team and let them know something unique about your book. So if it's published directly to Kobo Writing Life, email writinglife at kobo.com and just tell them about your book. Something useful, interesting, unique. Maybe it's about this series and how well it's done on Kobo in a particular country uh, for your previous titles. Uh, maybe there's an interesting story that they may even want to use for the Kobo Writing Life blog to share your story to other writers. Um, but again, another excuse to link to your book and also to put it in their minds and to, and to Make it, um, you know, they're all readers too. Maybe maybe someone on the Cobra Writing Life team is going to be interested in reading it. Similarly, if you're publishing through a distributor, um, you would email your distributor. So, you know, support at draft to digital .com and do the same sort of thing. Say, hey, my book is up. It's listed at all the retailers or it's listed at Kobo, it's listed at Nook, whatever. Let them know that your book is coming out. And Dan Wood um, is doing ongoing curation for Kobo promotion specifically, as well as some of the other retailers. But again, one of the jobs that we have is finding interesting titles and seeing if there's some commonalities and there's some promotions where we can suggest a promotion, uh, including authors, um, of, for getting them featured. Uh, again, getting them featured well in advance so that when it hits, all those other things you're doing to get attention and to mailing your your list and getting different promotion sites to push to it, you're getting some internal um, push as well. Um, next slide. Um, so the internal Kobo promotions are built through a tool. So if you have a Kobo Writing Life account uh, and you don't see promotions uh, up in the dashboard between eBooks and author services, you just email them, uh, writinglifeatkobo.com and say, hey, I'm publishing to Kobo through Kobo Writing Life. Here's my email address that I use to log in. Could you please add the promo tab? And usually during a business week, they'll get back to you within 24 hours. Uh, if you email them Friday at eight o'clock at night, chances are they're not gonna get back to you until Monday morning because again, they're humans. There's no bots. They don't outsource their customer service for the writers. Uh, but they, that's all done internally by folks in the office. So you're actually getting a real human every single time. And, uh, and that also when you're emailing uh, somebody at Kobo, never hurts to remember that they're readers and, 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 and treat them with, um, with kindness and respect as if you were walking into a bookstore and talking to a bookseller, because that's kind of what you're doing when you're talking to Kobo, when you're talking to most of the retailers and the distributors that are out there. Um, Third-party distributors, kind of like Draft to Digital, are, are pretty much treated uh, the way that uh, Random House or HarperCollins or one of the other publishers are treated. There's a big feed of data coming in all the time. And I'm working right now with Dan uh, Wood on uh, ways that we can do pitching to the merchandisers in the same way that sales reps do those pitches, again, to find 
more opportunity for uh, for authors. And similarly, what I'm really excited about is we've had some meetings with authors in the last couple of weeks where they we're really looking at doing stuff collaboratively with the Kobo Writing Life team. Uh, because again, it's up to you how you want to publish. And we really think authors should have opportunity to sell wide and to do well selling wide so that there can be lots of great competition between Kindle and Kobo and Nook and um, Apple and uh, Google, et cetera. So the next slide, please. Uh, the internal Kobo promos that work the best, uh, and again, they're not sorted uh, in any particular way, so you have to kind of do some scrolling. I usually reserve one day a week where I go in and see what's new there. Uh, the monthly 30% off, sometimes they're 40% off promos, they tend to work the best for most authors. They don't always work, but the, the beautiful thing about most of the Kobo promos is that they uh, they don't cost you anything unless you sell anything. So they usually just shave off 10% of what you would normally make, or you agree to discount it. So you're selling a lot more volume, but you're just making a little bit less on those. It's not like you've paid $800 for that book bub and hope you make your money back. The only ones that actually cost money are the free. Uh, and free still sells, and that's usually using a free short story as a lead into your universe or um, your writing in general, so people buy your other books. Uh, oftentimes, it's that free first book in series as well, and you can make your books free at Kobo. There's no exclusivity requirement for 90 days. Uh, you make it free permanently. Um, and if you're rejected from a promo at Kobo, don't despair. It is definitely not personal. Uh, unless you're a jerk, then maybe it's personal. But no, uh, just keep submitting. Uh, there's no minimum requirement. Nobody's looking and saying there's not enough reviews on this or anything like that. All they're really doing is they're looking at the cover. If it looks good, they're looking at the price. If it looks reasonable within the territory that they're in, um, that's accepted. Uh, half the time they're they're being uh, rejected because they had 500 submissions and only had room for 100 spots. And after they saw 150 titles, they were full. So applying regularly is one of the things that works consistently. And if you're ever confused and say, you know, I've I've submitted for promos time and time and time again, could you please tell me what I'm doing wrong? Is there something wrong with my book? Again, they're human, they're booksellers, they love helping writers, they only make money. If you make money, email them and ask. And you can do the same thing if you're publishing through a distributor, say, I'm still trying to figure it out. And, and ideally, you'll get an honest, um, not a mean honest response, but an honest response. Um, so on to the next uh, slide. Um, remember that people are paying attention. And if you want Kobo to help you sell more books, then um, ask what you're doing to help them sell. If I can, if I can sort of um, take a JFK quote and say, ask not what your Kobo can do for you, ask what you can do for your Kobo. Uh, I used to do this all the time when I worked at Kobo. An author would reach out and say, I'm not selling any books on Kobo. What the hell's wrong with you, Kobo? Um, and then I would go over their author website and see only giant links to Amazon and nothing else. And I was like, wow, um, are you helping yourself? Um, so are you including Kobo in your web links and your social media, et cetera? Are you including Kobo on all the other uh, platforms? Uh, again, they only make money um, if you sell books. They do want you to sell more. And I had been using, even when I worked at Kobo, I had been using the universal book links from draft to digital. It's free. You don't even have to publish through draft to digital to do that. I even use it for my traditionally published books as well. And you can provide custom name URLs. So you can say things like rather than, you know, books to read.com slash U2698H1, uh, whatever book that might be, if that's an actual book, and you can actually uh, custom name it to the name of your book. So if we move over to the next slide, I'll show you an example. Um, and this is good because it's not just Kobo uh, specific, but you know you can go to bookstory.com slash killing it on Kobo. And when you go to that site, unless as a customer you've used books to read and have identified you only read on Kindle or Apple or Google or Kobo or or whatever, um, it'll take you right to your favorite retailer. If not, it shows you all the retailers it's available on. And the reason that these links are powerful is that instead of having to constantly change your links at the back of your books, um, it's taken care of you automatically. And uh, I used to have to have four or five different versions of my EPUB files. I stopped doing that a couple years ago. I just use a single link and publish that to all the platforms. And again, uh, Apple gets really upset if you include links to Amazon, but they don't get upset if you include an inclusive link. 
and the same thing on Kobo, you include a, an inclusive link like that. You also get some analytics, which is kind of cool. So I can see that for me, you know, some of my books, uh, Amazon's the biggest, uh, Amazon usually is the biggest, but sometimes Kobo second, sometimes Apple second, and I think Playster is uh, one of the ones that came in second in terms of links. So it really helps you see for different titles uh, what's going on, and there's gonna be some more uh, analytics there. The next slide, please. Um, a couple basic things to remember is that the global pricing is critical. Whether you're using um, a Cobra Writing Life Direct or you're coming through a distributor, your metadata is critical. No keyword stuffing, none of this uh, stuff where you have to put the series title in uh, the title field. Um, you can use the fields the way they were meant. There are humans there and they're making decisions all along with the algorithms. And it does take a long time. It's not like you're going to publish your book to Kobo and have a sale on day one. You need to exercise a little bit of patience to gain some traction. And if you're running into an issue or you have any questions, just reach out. Ask uh, the folks at Kobo Writing Life if you're direct or ask your distributor. They're there to help you out. Kobo, at the end of the day, does not care if you're traditionally published or self-published. They care about putting a good book into the hands of good readers, and they care about actually selling books, not for uh, only 99 cents, but actual reasonable prices that uh, are respectable and allow people to continue to, to be a solid business. Now, I want to uh, just jump to the next slide and open it up to questions, because the next slide is really just blatant self-promotion. Cool. Uh, well, thank you so much, guys. So thank you, Mark, for joining us. It's been really, really useful. Uh, Mark, as he mentioned before, has a course on Readsy Learning. Uh, that's on, uh, we call it Hacking Kobo, but it covers a lot of the same points here, uh, perhaps in a bit more detail. Cheers and goodbye. <laughs>